Um, so hi, hello. Hope everyone is having a, a lovely Sunday. My name is Ben Burkhart. Um, I am a security analyst slash pen tester slash whatever they'll have me do at uh, Black Hills Information Security. Um, I live in Chicago, Illinois, and uh, I've been at Black Hills for about six or so months now. Um, previously before that, I was a senior security engineer at Evolve Security, which is actually, I believe, where I met Angela back in the day, the same boot camp program. That's the one. <laughs> That's the one. Chicago represent, Evolve represent, if anyone else is out there from Evolve. Um, so some of the cool stuff that I've worked on in the past, I did an APT compromise incident response project, um, which was one of the first big projects I got thrown on back in like 2018. Um, also known as the most stressful summer of my entire life. Definitely do not recommend that if you can avoid it. Um, I've done things like cloud security assessments for Fortune 25 companies. I've done a large amount of kind of recurial, recurring adversarial emulation, uh, purple team testing for, for organizations, which is always a lot of fun. When you get to have a little bit more of that back and forth with the blue team while you're doing testing and just about uh, every other kind of pen test in between. So web apps, external, internal, um, assume compromise, and everything that those entail. Some of the things that I enjoy outside of security, I like iced tea. Um, always have. I grew up in North Florida, so sweet tea was was big in my youth. Um, since then, I've moved on to unsweetened tea, just because it's better for me. And you know, do what you can. Uh, I like mechanical keyboards, um, like a lot of other people in tech. No surprise there. Uh, I like running. I hit 500 miles of jogging last year in 2021, which is a big goal for me. So, shooting for 750 this year. And I like Louise. This is um, a recently adopted retired racing greyhound that my girlfriend and I adopted last summer. So she's been a, a bit of a challenge, but also the light of our lives for the past six or so months. Um, so how did I get here? And this is something that I think is always interesting in the field of security. Everyone kind of gets here in a weird different roundabout way. Um, people like to make analogies about kind of the island of misfit toys. And, you know, it's very true. Everyone kind of ends up here in a different way. No one's path is the same. Um, and I think all of those different backgrounds and paths that kind of lead people to this field really help make people in this field stronger at what they do. Um, it provides like a variety of experiences that help inform the work that we do and, and also just makes people more well-rounded employees and individuals, things like that. So a quick background of how I ended up here. Um, I was always a tinkerer when I was a kid. I took things apart, put things back together. Um, I was obsessed with the movie Hackers, also like most of us were. Uh, my dad was really into computers, so I used to play Fisher Price games on his Commodore 64 at the office. He brought home um, an Intel i86 back in the day, so I kind of grew up on, on a command line with MS-DOS when I was quite young. Um, so I always knew I wanted to do something with computers as an adult, and when I was finishing up high school, which was not a particularly challenging endeavor, um, and that's not me bragging in the slightest, um, I decided to study computer sciences. So I applied to and was accepted uh, to the computer science program at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which was a pretty challenging program that I was incredibly not ready for. Um, first semester, I was put on academic probation, and the second semester, I failed out of the program. So after that, trying to figure out what else I wanted to do, I was also really into photography. Um, I slammed a little bit, but not as much anymore. And I think one of the things that drew me to photography as well is it's also a very technically oriented kind of practice, right? As far as all of the fine arts, um, I would say like AV stuff and cinematography and things like that are close, but photography is, is very technologically driven. So I was excited to study something that I could still use a computer, I could still play with fancy expensive tech, you know, all that fun stuff. Um, so I took some community college classes at Urbana-Champaign. I ended up coming up to the city of Chicago to, to finish school at Columbia College in about 2007. Um, and as I was finishing up, I was, you know, I needed to start making money and paying rent and doing all those things that people do. And like most people that I knew from art school, I ended up bartending after that. So my first job um, at a bar was at a craft beer and sausage bar in 2010 in Wicker Park. Um, and I kind of did that for quite a long time. Uh, I started to get tired of it as I got older. You know, I passed the 30 year mark. Um, staying up late wasn't fun. Uh, it felt like career progression was pretty limited. You're kind of hopping from cool bar to cool bar because so much of your income is subsidized by tips. So I started looking at, you know, getting back into technology. Um, one of my regulars from, from a bar that I worked at actually works at Kenna. Um, and he was the one that introduced me to the idea of getting into security. 
I looked into some, some boot camps, ended up deciding on the Evolve Security Boot Camp back in 2017, um, and went through the program. So after I finished that program, I was kind of thrown into consulting. Um, at the time, Evolve was kind of mostly a boot camp and academy type organization, but security services and doing actually actual delivery work and pen tests kind of picked up as, as time went on. So I gradually got put on more and more of those projects. And that was great. Um, it was what I always wanted to do. It was exciting. It was fun. It was technically challenging. I feel like I learned in the learned more in like those first like 30 days on the job more than I did at any other point kind of leading up to that um, as much as you try to. And, you know, cool tools, cool techniques, a lot of fun, but something that really stuck out to me and I didn't anticipate or expect, but probably should have realized is how much I was still talking to people. <laughs> and those of you that know me personally, um, I'm a pretty introverted, quiet person. Uh, I think I'm okay at talking to people, but it's not something that I actively choose to do. And I thought that by leaving bars, leaving the service industry and going to work uh, in tech somewhere, you know, I would have to deal with people less, you know, it was something that I was excited about doing because dealing with people at 4 a.m. on a, a Saturday night at a bar is not an ideal time to, to have conversations usually. Um, but once I got into, the, got into security, I realized I was talking to people just as much, if not more. Um, I was writing reports. I was doing kickoff calls with clients. I was delivering those reports. I was using soft skills to manage that stuff along the way. And that was kind of a, a shocker to me. So if, if there are people that are interested in getting into consulting, one thing that I would say to you is don't be surprised that you will need to end up being very client facing during a majority of your career. So why is this important? Um, as I kind of mentioned, consulting and bartending at the end of the day are kind of both service industry jobs, right? If you work for an MSP, service is in the name, managed service provider. Um, if you do delivery services, it's also in the name. So much like working in the service industry behind a bar, the, the clients that we work for, the people who very much dictate and inform the work that we do. Um, the deliverables that we hand over, you know, the product that we sell is, is very important. So when you're working behind a bar, that's obviously food and drink. Um, when you're consulting, that's some sort of actionable pen test report or audit report or something like that that you're going to hand off. But aside from those deliverables, the experience along the way is, is equally as important, you know, both for you and for the client. Um, this may seem obvious, but recurring clients are the best, right? Getting to know people, building those relationships, um, networking, and just helping an organization, you know, if you have an organization that comes to you and you do a pen test, you know, it's their first time ever doing a pen test, you give them a report, they go and fix those changes, you come back and test in a year, their security maturity level is so much, you know, further above and beyond where it was the first time. It's cool to see clients kind of grow and build their security maturity out like that. But also like on a financial and fiscal level, recurring clients are easier and cheaper than going out and finding new clients. And also they tell their friends, they tell their friends what a great experience they had with you, how attentive you were, uh, what white glove service they have, how quick you were to answer emails, polite, understanding, all of those things. All those things go a really long way um, in what is a very small field I've, I've come to realize. So all of these things um, are quite important. You know, the technical stuff is very important too, but all of these kind of little unspoken like soft skills, steps of service, how we communicate, how we listen, all these things are just as important as well. Um, and I'm sure we've all had bad experiences on both sides of that equation, right? We've all been to a bar where we had a terrible experience. Um, the server was on their phone the whole time. Your food was late. Things were wrong. Uh, you know, things were, things were messed up. The people working didn't do a good job of explaining or managing that to you. So you kind of felt like you got the short end of the stick. Um, I'm sure we've also all been on pen tests where we've kind of messed things up and done things that we wish we would have done better and, and stuff like that. So I think being able to take constructive criticism and feedback from those situations and, and learn what we can, you know, what we can just to be better from both sides of, of that equation is, is really important to growing as a consultant. Cool. So um, what are the things that, oops, sorry. One of the things that I like to talk about that people kind of don't always notice when you're going out for dinner or drinks are the, the two most important points of time in my experience and from what I've seen are kind of when you first walk into a place and when you leave. So kind of those bookends of that interaction, like when you walk in the front door, how long is it before someone greets you? You know, does it look like you need to wander around? Do you have to find your way to your own table? Things like that. Um, 
So that's very important to kind of set the tone for the evening, right? And in the consulting world, uh, the analogy of that is kind of the kickoff call. Obviously, there's like business development calls and everything that leads up to it. But when you as a technical resource get on that first call with the client, that's kind of your first exposure to them, your chance to listen and talk to them and get to know them and things like that. Um, the second most important part of that is kind of the end, right? So paying your bill and being thanked as you leave the space. Um, there's nothing that kind of ruins a great meal for me more than finishing your drinks, finishing your food, and then not seeing your server or your bartender for 15 or 20 minutes, you know, and you're just kind of hanging out. You don't really have anything to eat. You don't have anything left to drink. No one's kind of come and talk to you. By the time you do see them, they're like, oh, you need the bill. And then they have to go print the bill and then come back. Then you give them a card, then they go and come back. And that kind of just, to me, ruins the experience a little bit. So I've got a little snippet here from the milk and service or milk and honey service manual. This was a bar from New York, like the late 90s. Um, by a man named Sasha that kind of set the tone for a lot of like high-end cocktail culture in the late 90s and early 2000s. So it says, being aware of body language and eye movements, um, it's always better to anticipate the need for a check and drop it in a manner that doesn't make the guest feel rushed rather than to have them have them wait for the guest to ask for it. So I think anticipating needs um, in these kind these types of interactions is also a very important thing that we that we can be better about as consultants. So on that note, we'll talk about setting, managing, and meeting expectations, ideally exceeding as well if we get there. But um, as I mentioned, kind of the, the bookends, like the initial kickoff and kind of the final, those kind of set the tone for the, the course of the engagement, in my opinion. There's a lot of things that can go wrong in between, but if those if those kickoffs and those kind of finishing tying off notes go well, you can, you can manage everything else in between. Um, so we're going to talk about like initial kickoff calls first, some service industry examples of kind of like reading the room and getting to know your client. You know, if someone comes in on the first date, they sh you know, one person shows up before the other one, they clearly act very nervous, you know, they don't really know each other. How does that inform the way that you serve them as a bartender? You know, maybe you're more energetic, maybe you make it more of an interactive experience for the both of them. You're kind of like trying to make them have, help them have fun with one another, et cetera. Um, versus like a solo drinker or someone that comes in by themselves just as a book, you know, they kind of know what they want. You don't really need to spend too much time like engaging with them. They're here to like get their drink, eat their food, read their book, hang out and go home, et cetera. So conversely, in the consulting world, we need to figure out what the business drivers are behind an engagement, right? So when we get on that first call with the client, what are, what's driving them to do that pen test? Because pen tests aren't cheap. We all know that. Why are they spending this money on this engagement, right? Is it compliance driven? Is this something that needs to happen every quarter? Um, is there a way that we can say, oh, well, if this is compliance driven, let's make sure we hit PCI audit tests. Let's make sure we offer, you know, a letter of attestation or some sort of client facing letter that might show that we've done this, you know, for you that you can show your clients. Um, is it new infrastructure? Does that client say, oh, well, we're just in the process of migrating things from on-prem to AWS. We really want to test out just the way data flows and like what you can see from this subnet versus another subnet. Um, but really understanding what the client needs and wants out of that engagement really help you do the best that you can to provide value and help that client feel seen and understood. Um, another note that here I have here at the end is empathy and understanding. I think this is something that we often forget and is hard to find in the technical field and just in the world in general. But the clients that you may be working with, maybe they're slow to get back to you. Maybe they're not as quick as getting connectivity set up as you would like them to. You know, they may be overworked and stressed out and dealing with sick family members at home or a million other reasons. Um, so one thing I always like try and keep in mind is, is just be empathetic, be understanding, be kind with other people. Um, and that goes a long way. Another thing that goes a long way is owning your mistakes. Um, being proactive when things go wrong will, will set you high and far and above a lot of other people. Um, you know, if you're doing a pen test and you knock over a server, you need to call that client. You need to send an email, you need to call them, you need to leave a voicemail. If they don't get back to you quickly, at least you did something to say, hey, we ran a script. Um, now the server is not responding to ping anymore. Maybe y'all should go check it out. Because conversely, the opposite of that is that client having to reach out to you and say, hey, were you testing against this IP? Because all of a sudden one of our card processing servers is down and we've lost X amount of dollars in business, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so things will go wrong in the course of pen testing. They always do. Things go wrong in life in general. How you handle those things um, really speaks a lot to your character. And those are the kind of things that make clients want to come back to you and repeat business with you. Um, just owning those mistakes and also understanding where they came from and what caused them and doing what you can to make sure those things don't happen again in the future. 
So another good kind of bar example is if I was working as a bartender and I rang in food for someone um, and that food was taking quite a bit to come out, you know, there's a point in time when I should realize as a bartender, hey, they should have had this hummus plate right by now. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go back in the kitchen, we're going to check, we're going to come back out to the, the guest and proactively say, hey, I noticed the hummus plate is taking a little bit of the time, you know, they're working it right now, I promise it'll be out as soon as it can, maybe I can buy you around in the meantime while you're waiting. You know, so that's one example of also being proactive about noticing a problem and doing something to alert the client about it and being proactive to offer a solution to it. Instead of having that customer, that guest be like, hey, where's the food? It should have been here by now, et cetera, et cetera. Another good takeaway that um, you learn very quickly being behind the bar is that the, the whole world's kind of a stage, right? Especially when you're bartending. When you're behind a bar, you're not necessarily the entertainment or the reason why people go to an establishment, but everything that you do is is being watched right you're you're part of that establishment you're part of the scenery you're part of the ambiance you know eyes are on you whether you want them to be or not right so people are going to notice when you do things are you on your phone are you touching your face you know what's your posture like do you look bored do you look excited about work how are you holding yourself things like that um, so keeping that in mind and understanding that people are watching you i think is very important in the consulting world you know optics is, is very important, right? So meeting remotely because, you know, COVID and all of those things, I haven't done an on-site pen test in years. Um, how do you present well digitally, right? Do you have a nice webcam? Do you have a nice microphone? Do you have decent internet? I'm not trying to jinx myself by saying that. Um, is your audio and video quality clear and clean? You know, if you're sharing your window, are you sharing just the right specific window that you mean to? You know, are you sharing your entire desktop and accidentally doxing other clients for sensitive information? So kind of keeping all of that stuff in mind and how you present and what people see um, are very important. Another thing that I made a note of are visual indicators when you're listening. You know, I, I would always recommend that you have your webcam on, um, especially in the digital world. I feel like it's harder and harder uh, remotely to, to form those connections with people. And that's just one way that you can, you can be active and be engaged and, and be an active listener and nod your head and smile and things like that. Um, I've worked with other people in the past that haven't always had their webcams on, especially with client calls. And I, I've never really understood it, to be honest, right? Like clients are trusting you with access to their most sensitive networks and trusting you to, to test those, those assets. Like the least you can do is turn on your camera, you know, and smile and be engaged and let them know what you look like since you've got that kind of access. Another cool thing that, um, really struck out to me is kind of the power of narrative when it comes to selling things and when it comes to, to getting people interested and invested in things. So when you're selling things, and granted, I'm not a good salesperson, so this is just my opinion, but um, constructing a narrative helps people get excited about what you're talking, what you're selling and, and what you're offering them, right? So like if I say our special wine tonight is, you know, a nice dry red, it's eight bucks, let me know if you're interested. That's much less appealing than saying, oh, well, the wine by the glass tonight comes from this family and producer in Napa Valley, California. You know, their vineyard was destroyed last year in these wildfires. This bottle is part of, you know, their last remaining stock. They're trying to rebuild their family legacy. Are you interested? You know, that customer is going to be much more intrigued and, and they get to be a part of that story, right? They hear that story about the, that wine producer. By buying a glass of that wine, they're, they're now part of that story, right? People love being a part of that narrative. So how do we translate that to technical reports? Um, this is probably one of the biggest pain points that I've seen in consulting and something that people also don't see as a problem until it becomes a problem, right? How do we make highly technical reports digestible? How do we translate really technical findings into something that can be read and understood by people at that organization that have no idea what you're talking about, right? So whether that's the C-suite, excuse me, all the way down to like, you know, entry level analyst one, like how is, how can we make our writing and our reporting understandable by all of those people? And that's a really hard thing to do. Um, my boss, John, as he spoke earlier today, he likes to say that what levers can, can we point out that this organization can pull to fix these problems within a company? So always strive to be as accessible as possible when you write reports, um, have high level you know, executive summaries, and then get down into the dirty details if you can. Tell a story with your report. Get people interested in reading it. I think some of the most successful reports that I've written and turned in are ones that I've gone back and read and really enjoyed. You know, I started here. I found this. This led to this. You know, making that kind of an enjoyable story for people to want to read will get them more interested in the content and ultimately how they can fix that content as well. 
So I've got a couple kind of assorted um, pieces of wisdom that just kind of didn't really fit in anywhere else. But this is a quote that got thrown around a lot um, when I worked in bars and restaurants is that the most important rest, the most important position in the whole of the restaurant is the dishwasher, right? So there's a lot of things that you can take away from this. But for me personally, it's don't be too proud to get your hands dirty and do whatever you have to do, right? It doesn't matter how good the food is. It doesn't matter how awarded the chef is. It doesn't matter how innovative the menu is or how fresh it is or farm to table or anything. If there aren't clean plates, that food's not hitting the table and no one is eating that food. Um, develop healthy coping mechanisms. This is another thing that I think InfoSec is a very stressful field. I think the world can be pretty stressful these days, but bartending and serving was also a very stressful field. And there were a lot of people in that field that had a quick had quick access to substances as far as alcohol and drugs and all sorts of other things. So developing healthy coping mechanisms for when things get hard, you know, going for a run, reading a book, spending time with loved ones, um, cooking, but finding some way to alleviate stress. And, um, you know, that kind of stuff will, will save your life, quite honestly. I've got a quote here too from um, a talk called A Letter to a Young Bartender. This was from, what was this from? This was from Tales of the Cocktail, I believe, in like 2015 or 2016. Um, if you're not familiar, Tales of the Cocktail is kind of like the DEF CON of cocktails in the spirit world and things like that. Um, I would highly recommend looking it up and reading it if you're interested. I still reference it probably like once every six months or so. Um, it's definitely like more bartender focused, but it's kind of a very inspirational speech in general. So I've got a quote here from that. It says, you will not have to map your route to your destination. You will be guided. All of the people you work with from now on will be your guide to the destination you have chosen. If you're clear about what you want and are truthful when people ask you what you want and make yourself humble and available to guidance, you will reach that destination. So the other takeaway from that, that kind of speech that I like is just the cycle of like observing, like look at people that you respect in this field and the way that they do things. How do they present themselves in the internet? How do they present themselves in person? How do they present themselves at talks, right? The next step is doing the things, so doing it yourself, right? Trying to emulate those activities and, and do them as best you can. Um, third is be observed, right? So realize that as you are doing them, there are other people that are looking up to you the same way that you looked up to others and just be aware of those eyes on you and set good examples. And also put yourself out there, right? Um, do things like, like conferences, submit talks, you know, get out there and network and, and try and support others. Last but not least, um, transferable skills. So this is something that I think a lot of people with imposter syndrome definitely struggle with. Um, but I would say that a large majority of the, the, the skills required for this field, you can learn in a lot of other places, right? They're not always easy to like reframe those skills on a resume, but things like effective communication, um, communicating clearly, managing your time, managing yourself, a lot of those skills you'll learn in a variety of places. The other part of this job, that you don't learn in those places, the technical stuff, those can also easily be learned, right? There's tons of great content out there online. Black Hills has got free pay what you can classes, all sorts of things like that. Um, Cyber Mentor, you know, self-paced certificates, all the CompTIA stuff, OSCP, things like that. There's a wealth of resources out there for, for learning the technical capabilities, right? But it's not always as easy to learn kind of like those soft skills and all the other stuff. Um, you know, people ask me, last time I gave a talk like this, someone asked like, well, how can we learn some of these things if we're already in a field, right? And I do think that's a little bit harder to answer. Um, I think putting yourself out there is really important. I think a lot of people have talked about like stand up and improv classes um, to kind of help the way you communicate, the way you interact with people, stuff like that. I think also finding a good therapist is really important. I think mental health is kind of the cornerstone of the way that you deal with tough and stressful situations, the way that you react. Um, and finding a professional that you can speak to and help kind of give you tools to deal with stressful situations really helps make you a better, more, more well-rounded professional overall. Cool, so I think that's everything for kind of bar skills that lead into InfoSec skills. So now we're gonna quickly move into an introduction to cocktails. Um, and I know there are other people today that have talked about cocktails, so I'll try and not repeat things that you may have heard already. Um, we're going to talk about technique as well and kind of some basic ratios and structures for, for how people build cocktails. So first and foremost, we need good tools. Like most things in life, like pen testing, like literally anything else, um, having the right tool for the job is often 95% of success in what you're doing. 
Um, so I would recommend a Boston shaker set. I've got one here that I can hold up and show. Um, please don't use the ones with glass. Those scare me because you're gonna be hitting, you're gonna be shaking, you're gonna be moving. Um, why you do that with a piece of glass in your hand is beyond me. I think the number one injury that I've seen from, from bar stuff in the days is broken glass, fingers slashed open. We all use those to type and make money and security. So protect your hands and use metal. Um, the next thing we need is a measuring tool. So I recommend this Japanese style jigger. It's taller, it's thinner. It's got kind of indentations and markings on the inside of it that show where the different measurement levels are. Um, if we remember geometry, I'm sure everyone has seen kind of those cheap, short, wider jiggers that you kind of get for free at some point in your life and everyone's got one in a drawer somewhere. Um, because these are taller and thinner, when you're, when you're missing that line, the repercussions, um, like the amount that you're over under pouring are lessened by having that tall, thin shape. And then last but not least, a nice strainer. Um, this is called a Hawthorne strainer. There's one down here. This is the, the Cook's Country, America's Test Kitchen winner. You can see the anatomy of a winner. Um, there's also a strainer called a julep strainer, which look cool if you're doing stirred drinks, but they don't work for shaken drinks, but this one will work for both. So I'd recommend these. Um, it used to be you can only find these things at places like Cocktail Kingdom or other sorts of kind of specialty stores, but I'm sure you can find nice versions of these all on Amazon now these days. So why do we shake cocktails? Um, also kind of for the, just an overview, we're not really going to get into stirred drinks. We're not going to get into like old fashions, Manhattans, things like that. Building and balancing those drinks are a little bit more difficult because you're really mostly relying on spirits. Um, balancing these drinks, we're going to talk about sours is much easier with sugar and citrus. Um, so these are all mostly shaken drinks. And why do we shake drinks, right? So the number one thing that we're adding into a drink when we shake it is aeration. Um, this is a quote from the Savoy cocktail book that said, you should drink a cocktail quickly while it's still laughing at you. Uh, the other thing that gets added to that drink during the shaking process is it's chilled, right? No one wants to drink warm drinks, obviously, unless you're doing a hot toddy or some sort of room temperature, you know, straight whiskey, something like that. Um, we're also mixing those ingredients together effectively, and we're also adding dilution, right? So this is something that people often forget about, but roughly 25 to 35% of the volume of any cocktail that you're making is going to be water that's introduced into that cocktail during the stirring or shaking process, right? That helps round out everything in the drink, make sure it's not too hot, not too boozy. That's kind of like the cooking process of making a cocktail. So with that in mind, um, one of the most important things is the ice that you're using. Right? And if you take away anything, anything at all from this talk, this is what I would like y'all to remember is that ice is the most important part of a cocktail. Um, the smaller the ice, the more of it you're gonna use, the more surface area there is. That means that ice is gonna melt quicker. And that's gonna water down and dilute your drink faster. Um, this may make sense as you, know, you think about it and explain it, but you, you know, people forget that sometimes. So using the right ice when you're making drinks is very important. Um, and you can use any of these types of ice, right? It doesn't matter which one you use, but just understanding how as that, that size of the ice increases, the amount of time that you're gonna to need to shake is also increasing. Excuse me. Um, so there's no undiluting a cocktail, but you know, if you're using pellet ice, like that small, tiny chip chunk ice, like you might not even have to shake that really. Maybe just like a quick little toss and you're good to go because you can't go back, right? Once you've shaken that and added that water, you can't take that water back out of that drink. Cool, so now we're gonna talk about citrus and sugar. So these are the two kind of main flavor profiles that we're gonna be balancing with in addition to the booze. Um, Dale DeGroff is like widely credited with bringing back fresh juices and sometime in like the mid to late nineties. Before that, and I'm, still, you can find, I'm sure you can still find it a lot of places um, with sour mix. So these big bottles of like pre-mixed citrus and sugar, um, full of preservatives, full of, you know, food coloring additives, all sorts of nasty stuff. Dale DeGroff does have a cocktail book, but I would not recommend it. No shade to Dale, but it's just not a great book. Um, what we really need are just a couple simple things. So first and foremost, no pun intended, is simple syrup. Equal parts hot water and white sugar, shaken or stirred to combine. I've seen a lot of recipes that ask you to boil this. There's no need to boil this. Just turn the water in your sink faucet as hot as it'll go. Add an equal amount of sugar. Let it get all mixed up together, and you're good to go. Um, the next thing that's very important is fresh squeezed and strained lemon or lime juice. Squeeze citrus makes or breaks cocktails. Um, if you're doing fresh, fresh squeezed juice, that stuff starts to go bad and oxidize within 24 to 48 hours. You might not taste it, you know, if that's all that you've had, but if you taste side by side that same cocktail with lime juice that's fresh squeezed 
versus lime juice out of one of the key lime bottles, you know, at the grocery store that's not even in the fridge, just sitting on the shelf, you can taste an absolute difference. Um, and then the last thing we need is booze. So this is kind of dealer's choice, whatever you want to use to make whatever you, you want to drink. Um, there's a really good book out called The 12 Bottle Bar. If you're interested in kind of building out like a small, small bar at home, you don't really need hundreds and hundreds of bottles. Um, you know, maybe a couple of base spirits that you're interested, in, maybe a couple of liqueurs, a couple of modifiers. That's really all you need. Cool. So now we're going to talk about measuring ingredients. So as I talked about with the jigger, there's kind of markings on the inside for, you know, how you need to measure where the fill line is. Um, I've got this handy infographic that I will use for the remainder of the presentation to annotate different sizes. I'm going to do my best to call them out too, but um, the nice thing about this jigger is it's two ounces on one side and then one ounce on the other, and there should be markings inside for one and a half ounces, three quarters of an ounce, half an ounce. Um, one quarter of an ounce may or may not be marked, but this one you can kind of eyeball since it's a small measurement. So this is what we're going to be using to measure all of our ingredients for drinks. Cool. So how do we build? Um, we talked about the Boston shaker. So there's a tall one and a short one. What I like to do is build in the short one um, because as a clumsy person, it is much harder to knock over. Um, when you're building cocktails, you usually try and do the order of kind of priciness of the ingredients, right? So the cheapest things first. It's much easier to put in three quarters of an ounce of lime, accidentally add too much sugar, and then just dump out some, some lime and sugar juice rather than waste two ounces of rum that you can't get back. Um, so keep that in mind, trying to build from, from cheapest to most expensive, usually almost always do base spirit last. Filling the smaller tin with all of your ingredients, right? And then we're gonna fill the bigger tin with ice, um, as much ice as you can, all the way up, right? So once we fill it with ice, we're gonna close the shaker, give it a hit. Um, this looks scary because it's just two pieces of metal, but thermodynamics really helps us here because we add that cold ice and the booze that's gonna cause the metal to contract. Um, it's gonna create a nice seal. It's actually gonna be hard to open this once you put ice and booze in here and shake it. Um, it doesn't matter how you shake. It doesn't matter what your posture is, what you like to do, whatever works for you, whatever feels good. Uh, the one thing I would recommend is do it hard and do it fast. And if you're ever worried, definitely undershake versus overshaking. Because I said, you can't undilute a cocktail. There's no getting that water out once you've already put it in. Um, and chances are you might be serving that cocktail on ice later. So the last thing you would want to do is over dilute a cocktail just to pour it on ice and have it get even more diluted as it sits in that ice. So if you're, like I said, if you're using pellet ice, look up swizzling, just put it in a cup, give it a quick zip, zip, some sort of spoon, good to go. Um, the hardest thing about these is opening them. That can take a bit of practice. If you look at this image here, what we want to try and do is create a straight line with one side. Um, and then if we look at it from the top down, as you can see in this image here, if this point is kind of six o'clock or nine o'clock, you're going to want to hit perpendicular to where that seal is. So hitting it on the side, and it'll get a nice crack. And you'll be able to open it. That does take a little bit of practice, but um, you'll get the hang of it. So now we've got ingredients, we've put them in the shakers, we've shaken it, we're ready, ready to, to pour it off. And you know we have a couple of different varieties of how we can serve that drink. So some of the main ways we do it are up, so it's in a coupe glass, which is usually neat with no extra ice, um, on the rocks, which is obviously over ice, or we can serve it long, which is usually in like a Collins glass over ice with a splash of something on top, right? So these are often like a Tom Collins, something like that, where you're gonna build a cocktail and then top it with just like a little bit of soda water. Um, I said ice is very important to making cocktails. Um, glasses are not important at all. One thing I would like to say is make sure to chill your glasses before you pour drinks into them. Um, we took all this time and energy and we're very intentional about getting that cocktail to just the right temperature for us to consume it. The last thing we want to do is pour it into like either a room temperature or even worse, like a warm glass and have the temperature of that glass start to negatively affect the, the quality of that cocktail that we just spent time making. Cool, with that in mind, um, this is the first actual recipe, of the presentation. This is the basic sour recipe, um, also known as like the two, three quarter, three quarter. And this is one of the, the most stable kind of recipes. Nice, easy ratios, very easy to remember. It's also very easy to modify, excuse me. Um, and one of my favorite drinks of all time is, is this build, which is the daiquiri. So that's two ounces of white rum, three quarters of an ounce of lime juice and three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup. Um, this is kind of like the, the rest in the middle, kind of the pocket for where we are when we're going to make drinks. We can add things wherever we want and kind of get weird, 
But this two, three quarter, three quarter of two ounces of booze, three quarter citrus, three quarter sugar, is kind of like what's gonna give us a good starting point for balance. As you're making drinks, obviously you can taste as you go. If you want things a little bit sweeter, you want things a little bit drier, obviously adjust accordingly, but this is a really good starting point for kind of finding that balance in drinks. So with that in mind, you know, it's often intimidating when, you know, you work behind a bar trying to remember all of these different cocktails. But one of the cool things about working with these ratios is it's really easy to sub in different ingredients or make slight modifications to that base ratio and have a completely new drink. So if we pop over here, um, so this is some other sours you may know. So using that same two, three quarter, three quarter build, if we sub in gin or vodka and do lime and simple and a little bit of orange bitters, we've got a classic gimlet. If we do gym, line, and simple, but do a little bit of muddled mint in there, when we shake it, we've got a south side, which is this one right here. Um, if we do whiskey, lemon, and simple, and do egg or egg white, or egg white or no egg white, we've got a whiskey sour. Um, and then if we do gin, lemon, and honey, we've got a bee's knees. So these are all like well-known classic drinks. They're all kind of like that same basic two, three quarter, three quarter ratio. A quick note here too, about shaking with egg whites. Um, I know Robert talked about it earlier in his talk, um, if you're not interested in, in messing with egg whites because you don't want salmonella or you're vegan or anything like that, uh, a cool trick is to use aquafaba, which is a really fancy word, uh, but it's really just the juice that's in a chickpea can. So if you get a can of chickpeas, like Goya chickpeas at the store, strain out that juice, you can sub in that juice in a cocktail and it'll provide that same consistency and body in a drink that you would get from adding an egg white to a drink. Here's some other slight sour variations. So kind of still working with that same two, three quarter, three quarter. Um, so we take that daiquiri build, the white rum, lime and simple, but we put it in a Collins glass and we add a little bit of mint and top it with soda water. We've got a mojito. We take that same two, three quarter, three quarter and add one quarter ounce of allspice, which is kind of like a, a cinnamon clove allspice, very kind of winter baking flavor liqueur. Add a quarter ounce of that, we've got a lion's tail. Um, bourbon lemon honey is a gold rush. Pisco lime simple is a Pisco sour, once again, with or without egg white. I kind of put icons here for how these are traditionally served, but honestly, like how you want to serve these up around the rocks is really entirely up to you. Um, with the exception of the egg white drinks, I wouldn't recommend doing egg white drinks in the rocks, but all these other ones, you can kind of serve however you want. If you want to get more enjoyment out of your cocktail, you know, you could take any of these and put them in, put them in a Collins glass, put a splash of soda, on or soda water on there and make a little bit longer of a drink, tastes a little bit less boozy. Um, and lasts a little bit longer because you've got some more volume in the cup. The next build I want to talk about is the daisy build. So we're taking that simple two, three quarter, three quarter, but instead of that three quarters of simple syrup, we're going to sub in some other things, right? So we're going to get some added sugar from orange curious out here, and then we're going to supplement that with simple syrup. So the same two ounces of base spirit, we're going to do tequila, three quarters of an ounce of lime juice, and then instead of three quarters of an ounce of simple, we're gonna do half ounce orange curacao and a quarter ounce of simple syrup, just to supplement that and also add in some complexities from that orange curacao. Um, so this is a margarita recipe. If anyone's from Chicago, you might recognize the, the menu and these yellow chairs from a, a famous taco establishment here in Wicker Park. This is their margarita recipe. Don't tell them I told you that. Um, but yeah, so this is the daisy build, kind of taking that initial ratio, but subbing in another liqueur that adds some complexities of flavors and lets us have a little bit more fun. So here's some other famous daisies that have been made in the past. Um, we got a sidecar, which is kind of a similar thing with brandy or cognac and orange curacao. We've got a cosmopolitan, which most people don't know is a daisy, but if made correctly, is a very delicious drink. Um, I like to make this with just like a scant, like quarter ounce of cranberry, mostly for color more than anything. Um, you're not really looking for cranberry flavor in that drink. Most of the flavors from the orange curacao. Uh, the death daisy up here on the right, this was a, another Chicago drink where you're not using, um, you're subbing in two liqueurs, so you're doing Aperol and St. Germain. It's a nice pink color, um, very light, very effervescent, very floral, very fruity, uh, very well balanced, would highly recommend that. And then we've also got the aviation, which is a little bit more floral forward as well. Cool. So the last um, kind of basic build we're going to talk about is the equal parts build. Um, probably the most famous of these drinks is the last word. So what we're doing with these equal parts builds is we're not using any sugar at all. All the sugar in the drinks is coming from the booze and other liqueurs that we're adding to it. So the last word is three quarters of an ounce gin, three quarters of an ounce lime juice, three quarters of an ounce green chartreuse, and then three quarters of an ounce Luxardo Maraschino. Um, these definitely taste a little bit drier because we're not adding any like additional sugar into the recipe. Um, but they're quite delicious. So last word is one of my favorite drinks. Um, another quick, easy win is subbing mezcal for gin in the last word. People love that. It's a fantastic cocktail. 
And here are some other equal parts drinks that you may or may not have heard of. Um, the final ward is a last word, last word spinoff that's got yellow chartreuse and bourbon and lemon instead of gin and green chartreuse. Uh, the paper plane is kind of a newer classic cocktail, also from New York. Um, I'm not sure exactly where, but bourbon, lemon, Amaro Nonino, and Aperol, which is quite delicious. Um, and then the Corpse Reviver, number two. So playing with equal parts and just using all of the sugar in that drink from added liqueurs is like another fun way to kind of take out that sugar and add more complexity because you're mixing in other spirits. Um, so this slide is called Creating a Monster. And I wanted to touch on this because it's a fun drink to make. It's a fun drink to drink, obviously. Um, and kind of break down where this comes from because a lot of people don't know. But we're gonna talk about the Long Island iced tea real quick. And this is kind of a split-based daisy. So what we've got is we're taking that initial two ounces of booze, we're bumping it up to three. Um, we're gonna split that three ounces across all of the white boozes or the clear boozes in the bar. So gin, white rum, tequila, vodka, same three quarters of an ounce of lemon, same half ounce of curacao, same quarter of simple, and then top of Coca-Cola. Um, and that's a Long Island iced tea. So a lot of people don't know that's kind of originated from that daisy belt. Real quick, some ideas for further improvisation at home. Um, adding a quarter ounce of Campari to any drink and calling it a bitter version of it, or if you're from Chicago, adding a little bit of alert to that drink, making fun syrups. Um, ginger syrup is one of my favorites. Making coffee syrup, just like the same as making simple syrup, except we're using coffee instead of hot water. Infusing vodka with tea um, because of alcohol, you know, I'm not sure how osmosis works, but you don't need to heat up booze to really make infusions, as the last talk also mentioned. So putting some tea bags and booze is a great way to add some unique flavor characteristics to something like vodka. Um, and then just kind of playing around with any other sorts of liqueurs that you have to kind of replace that sugar and simple syrup in the recipes. I've got a slide here quick for further reading. Um, there's some websites, there's some books uh, if you're interested in more. Uh, the Bar Book is my favorite by Jeffrey Morgenthaler. It's a really good kind of mix of technique um, as well as like tips and tricks and recipes. So probably like the best all around book for making drinks at home. And then the last slide I wanna to get to with my last minute here is my favorite drink to make um, and drink, which is the Jungle Bird. So we didn't really talk about tiki, but um, this is a tiki drink, with two ounces of rum, lime juice, Campari to kind of bitter, um, bitter out and kind of even out some of that sweetness from the pineapple juice, um, simple syrup and a little bit of chinar, which is like a dark artichoke liqueur, which kind of adds some bitterness to it. And cool, I think that's about time on the dot.